all of us are really glad that you're here today to learn more about what's going on at the Supreme Court this term. Um, we talked a little bit before we got started on what we wanted to emphasize today. And I think we've come to the consensus that we wanna share a few resources that we use as Supreme Court experts in this series. And we, we wanna be very clear that you don't need to be an expert in the Supreme Court to follow what's going on right now. And it's really important to us and um, I think to scholars that do the type of work that we do, that this information is consumable um, by the public. So I think I'll start by showing um, a website that all three of us use to keep up to date because there are daily updates going on at the Supreme Court that are not covered in the normal media. We all use um, this website called SCOTUS blog, and I'll just show you a bit about what that looks like. And this is a website that is um, a nonpartisan organization. This is called SCOTUS Blog, of course. Their headline is Independent News and Analysis on the US Supreme Court. So they have a lot of really useful information. So here, this is brand new on the homepage from today that the court declined to take up a petition seeking to overturn the insular cases. And so you can click and read a short article about that. That's very readable. Um, they also have petitions of the week argument analysis, information on the emergency docket, which is uh, colloquially known as the shadow docket now. And I use this in my classes so they can click on um, October term 2022. And you can come here to see all the cases that um, will be for this October sitting when they were argued. And you can also click on the case. So here's Merrill v. Milligan, which is the voting rights case th um, this term. And you can look there's coverage of this case. You can click on the application and it'll take you directly to the court's document to read. So we think this is really useful. Um, it also comes, they have podcasts that talk about cases that are coming up. They have a Twitter. Um, their information is very user-friendly and I think their interface is very user-friendly. So we thought we'd start with that one. And then um, Julie and Matt will share their favorite resources. Julie, did you want to go ahead? Uh, sure. I just wanted to give a shout out to the election law blog, which is going to be a great go-to resource for those of you who are interested in following um, the various cases that we'll be discussing elections this season. All right, and the uh, site that, or the source that I was going to share I'll also share my screen here. Can everybody see the OEA site? Uh, this is another website that collects information on cases before the Supreme Court, but one nice useful thing that I like uh, about it is if we click on the cases, and one of the cases that I'll talk about later uh, is Reed v. Gertz, but you could pick any one of these cases. You could sort them by term, uh, subject matter, um, etc. And if you if you click on any one of these cases, read the Gertz is the one that I was going to talk about later. And so if, if it's already been argued, you'll see the link to the oral argument. I'm sort of hovering the mouse over it on the left menu bar. And if you click on the oral argument there, the transcript comes up uh, from the Supreme Court uh, website or the, the audio comes up and it's already been transcribed for you. So I'm just gonna press play briefly so you can see what this looks like because the audio will start playing and then the prompt will uh, guide you through the transcript. Okay, the case of Reed versus I won't play an extended clip, but this is a really nice way of, of uh, reviewing the transcript of a case. Uh, sometimes you can listen to it, you can track it visually where you are. Uh, and some people also, if you notice the timings, like there's there's a counter down below that's giving you a second by second location within the transcript. Some people use these transcripts, um, including uh, Professor Bird, uh, to examine uh, the content of the uh, argument of the text of, of the transcript because you can process this text through software 
and use these timings uh, down below to locate specific portions of the argument. Um, let me go out of here. Were we going to move on to other things, or should should I move on to the Martin Quinn scores? And yeah, I think so. So one thing you'll notice also, if you click on one of these arguments, you can see the justices up here arranged at the at the uh, about at the top. And in some of the other locations, and in, in the OEA website, in the case summaries, they'll identify the justices by ideological orientation. I, I just found out right before we started from Professor Bird that the, this the data source used to be different, but now it's from uh, something called the Martin Quinn scores. This is uh, Andrew Martin and Kevin Quinn. Um, uh, both political scientists who study the Supreme Court. But basically, they try to aggregate all of the votes case by case for the justices. And based on the frequency with which the justices agree with each other, right, vote in a similar direction, uh, justices will be seen as more close uh, to each other in space, um, in a one dimensional space. Uh, and if they tend to disagree with each other, right? They tend not to vote in the same direction. They'll be farther away. So I'll stop sharing this screen and share a different image. Can everybody see this figure? Yes. So this is uh, only the last 30 years from 1990 through the end of the last term, uh, which ended in June, 2022. And this figure includes um, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. She's the blue line towards the bottom here. But if we just look at the axes, I should back up and say that the horizontal axis captures the year, so you can get a sense of what uh, term or what season of the Supreme Court we're talking about. The vertical axis is that aggregate score that uh, we talked about a second ago. Uh, positive scores uh, tend to identify conservative directions or the conservative leanings of the justices, and negative scores on this scale identify the liberal justices. So at the very top, just to just to maybe emphasize this, is Justice Clarence Thomas, and he's been consistently the most conservative justice on the court. That's this sort of gray green line up at the top. Uh, just below him, we can see Justice Alito becoming increasingly conservative. Conservative, right? His score is becoming more and more positive over time. Uh, and then Justice Barrett, who's been on the court just a couple of years. Uh, Justice, uh, then Gorsuch, and then Justice Kavanaugh. And then below them, above the zero line, so anything above the zero line would be a conservative justice, is uh, Justice Roberts. And we see that he was becoming a bit more centrist and then has kind of turned around and become more conservative. Uh, below the zero line are um, the three current, well, not the three, two of the current justices, and then this lavender line is Justice Stephen Breyer, who just recently retired and has been replaced by Justice Jackson, Ketanji Brown Jackson. So we can't see her yet. We won't be able to locate her on this space until the end of next year or until next summer. And then uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg is the blue line here. She's also not on the court anymore. She passed away in 2020. So the current makeup of the court is these six conservative justices clearly above the zero line. And then two of these lines below the zero line, Justice Sotomayor is at the, at the bottom here, sort of becoming uh, increasingly progressive or liberal over time uh, with a lowercase l. And then again, Justice Jackson will be joining uh, Justice Kagan and Justice Sotomayor uh, likely below the dashed line. I just wanted to show some visual depictions of how we locate justices in ideological space. 
I don't know if uh, Professor Bird or Professor Knopkoff would like to say anything else, but I'll stop sharing this. Yes, All right, Christine, why don't you uh, talk about what is on your mind right now? Right, so we have some very important cases coming up this term, and it is very difficult to identify just one case that's going to be the, the blockbuster case of the term. Um, I'm very concerned about the affirmative action cases coming up. These are the students for fair admission cases where the defendants are Harvard University and the University of North Carolina. Uh, Professor Novkov is going to talk more about those cases in detail, but I want to draw everyone's attention to, to what we typically call in, in jargon terms as sleeper cases or cases people aren't paying a lot of attention to that have recently been docketed but do not have oral argument dates yet. And these are the two tech law cases. So there are two different cases, um, both from the Ninth Circuit, actually one against Google and one against Twitter. And what they are alleging in these cases is that uh, Google and Twitter should not be held liable for activities that were conducted on their platform. So they provide a platform and they can't be held liable for everything people do on those platforms, including the sharing of content. And so it, these cases are happening particularly in the context of anti-terrorism statutes that have been passed by Congress, where you are not allowed as a corporate entity to aid and abet terrorist organizations. Specifically, people are very concerned about the role that social media is playing in recruitment to organizations like ISIS. And so people are trying to hold Twitter, Facebook, Google accountable for sharing these different content. And um, even if they don't know that they are doing that, they are helping ISIS recruit people um, within the United States. And this is gonna be a very difficult case for the court to decide because they are not technology experts, right? So we have, we've all met lawyers who are not technologically advanced. A lot of the attorneys I know still use WordPerfect. They haven't even moved on to Word yet. So how are they going to engage in regulating the technology sphere? Um, we're gonna run into free, free speech issues and corporate liability issues. Um, the other problem is that this can, if the decision comes down in a way that holds companies liable, it can be, hold them liable for things that we think are a positive use of social media, like spreading information about how to seek an abortion, how to get an abortion pill, where should you go? And people can be held liable for spreading that type of information if that becomes politically unpopular as well. So we're going to see a lot of um, instances over the next four to five years where the court is wrestling with these tech um, issue cases, and I think they're ones to watch, and they're not getting the type of media attention that I think is super important for them. Um, political scientists are studying this issue of the role that tech plays in recruiting people to extremist organizations. That research is really interesting. Um, people are running experiments on TikTok. You make a TikTok, you make yourself a 12-year-old boy. How fast are you sorted into white supremacist TikTok content by the types of videos? videos that you click on. And I think the shortest number that they found in that experiment was like six to seven videos, depending on what's going on. And I, I it's a scary time for, for tech law. And I, I think we should be paying attention to that as well. And that's my pitch. So I'll hand over the microphone. Thanks. Um, Matt, do you want to go next or you want me to go next? I think I'll be brief, uh, just focusing on one case and then uh, turn over, turn it over to you. Is that okay? Sure. Uh, one of the case, the, the kinds of cases I tend to pay a lot of, well, I, I pay a lot of attention to some of the blockbuster cases, but <laughs> some of the cases that I pay closer attention to are some of the criminal procedure cases. These also tend to fly under the radar. Uh, some of them tend to be kind of dry. Um, well, as, as the as the as the term criminal procedure uh, sounds, right, sort of gen tends to elicit a, a yawn. Uh, but many of these cases have to do with protecting um, people from wrongful con convictions. And one of the cases that was argued last Tuesday, just last week on October 11th, is the case of Reed versus Gertz. Um, 
And again, we could use these sources that we just covered, right? SCOTUS blog or OYE to go back and, and read up on the facts of the case, check some journalistic coverage, read some of the briefs in the case, or even listen to the oral argument. Um, but basically the, the facts, the, the question that the court is being asked to consider in this case is uh, when should somebody who's been convicted of a crime in state court, assuming they've already been convicted, if they want to challenge any of the DNA evidence in the case, maybe uh, request post-conviction DNA testing, at what point should they do it? Should they do it right away as soon as the first state court uh, is done, sort of just after the trial and conviction? Um, or should they wait until the end of the entire appeals process? And this might sound like, sound like a minor technicality, but if if you set that clock early on, it's more likely that somebody might miss it and it raises a bunch of other practical sort of logistical considerations. Uh, but in this case, uh, Rodney Reed was um, accused and then eventually convicted um, by an all white jury in Texas. And he's a black man. So in the 1990s, 1998, if I remember correctly, um, he's a black man convicted uh, by an all white jury of uh, sexually assaulting and killing a 19-year-old white woman um, and sentenced to death, right, importantly. Uh, later, the, the execution was stayed based on some evidence that, that he may have been wrongfully convicted, including the fact that he and the victim had a consensual relationship and that she had a fiance who had a history of violence uh, including violence against women. So there were some strong indications that it was the other man who may have been um, the assailant. Uh, in any case, during the Rodney Reed did not request a DNA testing. He, he wanted some of this DNA testing to be done in order to help exonerate him, exonerate himself. And the court said no. The, the, the high criminal court in Texas said no, that he should have done it. Uh, at the very early on, right, right at the conclusion of the of the of the trial, so that's what this case is about. Uh, there are some other cases that provide some larger context. Um, one of the podcasts that uh, I think several of us tend to listen to, strict scrutiny, commented that it's it's very strange that the court is sort of increasingly resistant to let people prove their innocence. <laughs> Uh, and sort of sits, uh, tends to rely on, on, on uh, narrow procedural justifications to prevent people even from having the opportunity to prove their innocence. Um, and then it's also ironic in the context of um, two of the male members currently on the Supreme Court having insisted on their own due process when they themselves were accused in their confirmation hearings uh, of, of wrongdoing, including uh, sexual assault. So this, this case is interesting for a lot of reasons, and I encourage you to pay attention to it. I'll stop there. Uh, thank you so much, Matt. And thank you also for giving the shout out to Strict Scrutiny. If you are into podcasts, uh, that one should definitely go on your list uh, to listen to whenever it comes out. Um, I'm gonna take a bigger picture look here. Um, in the US, as you know, we have presidential administrations that have their particular flavors and agendas. Uh, we often have a longer periods of partisan control over Congress, but generally too, there are these longer standing regimes in which we see fairly settled consensuses around big questions of governance and federalism, uh, federalism configurations with the struggles around these things being more at the margins. Uh, since the mid-1970s, uh, conservatives have sought to disrupt and dismantle the governing consensus that was established late in the New Deal and strengthened with statutory and administrative developments in the 1960s and the 1970s. What are the hallmarks of this? Well, the so-called administrative state or the practice of allowing administrative agencies to make rules and regulations without a lot of extensive direction from Congress so Congress would pass a very broad statute, delegate authority to the administrative agencies to run uh, policy under it. Uh, strong federal intervention to correct the structural legacies of Jim Crow in the South and to address public and private discrimination nationally. 
um, just generally broader federal powers to manage economic and other issues that seem to require national coordination and an expansion of rights of a variety of types um, under the Bill of Rights and under the concept of liberty that is contained in the 14th Amendment. Since the mid 1970s, what we've seen is kind of incremental chipping away at the foundations of this regime, uh, a, a process that accelerated in, um, in the last decade. Uh, we saw some fights over the Voting Rights Act, uh, in particular, think of Shelby County in 2012 as a major blow. There's been a revival of a more robust vision of state power under federalism as a check on the national government. As we've seen, uh, there was this incremental process of allowing more restrictions on abortion. And there were a series of uh, challenges to affirmative action and an increased insistence on reviewing these kinds of programs through a lens of strict scrutiny that made them harder to get through approval. Yet, as this was going on, there were still some kind of surprising outcomes that showed that it wasn't just this whole wholesale conservative gradual walk back. Um, the ACA was upheld under the taxing power that Congress has. We've seen substantial expansion of constitutional rights for the LGBTQ community. And until recently, even when the court was uh, allowing more restrictions on abortion, uh, the justices were holding on to that idea that there is some kind of fundamental right uh, to choose abortion. What I would say about the 2022 term is that we need to look both at the court's rulings uh, that they have been issuing and at what cases the court is agreeing to hear. So looking back at 2021, the most interesting division for me was not that big gap that you saw in Martin Quinn's scores between the liberal wing of the court and the conservative wing of the court, but rather between the justices who seem to be what I would define as the center conservatives. So very loosely, I'm talking about Justice Roberts and Justice Kavanaugh and the hard right on the other hand, primarily Alito and Thomas, and to some extent, Neil Gorsuch um, with Barrett still, I think not, on the court long enough to be completely fitted into this, um, into this framework. Um, in practical terms, you see how this has played out in two of the major cases in 2021, uh, Dobbs, uh, which overturned Roe versus Wade on the one hand and West Virginia versus EPA on the other. In Dobbs, of course, the hard right won the day. Uh, they were able to overturn Roe. This is not incremental at all. Uh, and they eliminated most, if not all, national limits on what states can do to regulate abortion. In West Virginia versus EPA, this was the case that um, invalidated the EPA's attempt to regulate some forms of uh, greenhouse gases. The center right was able to hold on. Uh, Roberts wrote the opinion for the court, and while the court restricted EPA's ability to regulate, it did not entirely undercut the foundations of the administrative state in some ways that court watchers had been predicting. So my question looking ahead is where are we going to see these tensions playing out this term and what is going to happen? Uh, which, which conservative uh, coalition is going to carry the day? Sackett versus EPA is a case very similar to West Virginia versus EPA, but rather than addressing the Clean Air Act, it addresses the Clean Water Act. It's a case that challenges the scope of the EPA's power to regulate to protect wetlands. And a lot of court watchers are thinking that um, this uh, it's going to go the same way as West Virginia versus EPA. And the question is just how broad the scope of that ruling is going to be. Um, another case a lot of people are watching is Merrill versus Michigan, which involves a direct challenge to Congress's ability to bar voting practices that discriminate on the basis of race. And this is kind of tying into two of these agendas that before now seem to be pretty incremental, may be accelerating, uh, looking at race conscious practices and directly questioning Congress's ability to uh, regulate, even when it's a situation where Congress has that authority, authority directly under the 14th Amendment. But the Voting Rights Act, uh, as we know, is a statute that dates back to 1964, and the court seems ready to kind of call into question how that works. 
And then, of course, there are the two students for fair admissions cases, both of which involve affirmative action. The court seems poised to do something about affirmative action. Um, and it may be a situation somewhat like Dobbs, where there is a, a struggle within the court about whether to say outright that they're going to overrule a series of cases that have supported affirmative action in limited forms and insist that all such government programs must be colorblind, or whether they will find a, a narrower, more incremental carve out uh, to address these practices um, while still leaving the idea that the government may, in some circumstances, be able to recognize race. Um, all of this, I think, uh, raises some serious questions about the court's legitimacy because the court is going uh, along some uh, fairly drastic lines here in ways that I think challenge what many people believe the court should be doing or can be doing uh, in going away from where a lot of public opinion settles on the substance of questions that are, that are at issue. Um, to show you this a little bit more directly, I've got um, a couple of Gallup polls that I've been able to pull together uh, from the Gallup website. Actually, this is from a more recent story. But if you see here, you can see my screen. On the top, you get job approval ratings of the Supreme Court. Uh, this goes all the way back to 2000, that very uh, brief um, blip up in disapproval was in uh, January um, after the Bush versus Gore was decided in December. But as you can see, you know, the court is, is kind of not looking as good as we're accustomed to see it looking. And in particular, uh, most recently, we're seeing some pretty sharp upticks in disapproval for the court, which is an unusual phenomenon in American politics. And we see, of course, that uh, this, is, uh, this is very partisan in the way that, that people are perceiving it. But even, even among Republicans, that you're seeing some disapproval of what the court has been up to which is quite interesting. You know, I don't want to interrupt, but um, the projected screen is doing a little bit of a flashing dance on our end. And I'm wondering maybe if you make it full screen, it might stop. Um, just because I know this is important. I want everyone to be able to see it. Yes, that, that's perfect. Thank you. I'm sorry about that. No okay. worries. I'll leave it up a little bit longer um, while I'm talking so you can have a chance to absorb these numbers a little bit better. Um, so yeah, uh, just as, as a quick aside, some of the, the bumps up and down that you see is a, a, a function of when polls are taken. If polls are taken in late June or early July after the court has released a controversial decision, approval may be, ratings may uh, tick down a little bit, but traditionally they tended to tick back up afterwards. You see that most notably um, right here in, uh, in, in 2005, um, the court had released uh, a couple of decisions that got people kind of worked up, but then it bounced right back up again. What's unusual here is that you see the sharp decline in the court's approval um, after uh, the, the ruling in Dobbs, but it does not seem to be bouncing um, back to a, a kind of more normal level in any kind of quick way. So, you know, how durable is this? I think it's too soon to tell. Um, and then the other question is, will it matter? Traditionally, the court has been fairly vocal about saying that they're not going to worry a lot about public opinion. That is not their function as an institution. But we know that they pay attention to these things and particularly they pay attention when it seems like they're, they're their authority might be under threat in some way. Um, one possibility is that their awareness that they're on a little bit more shaky ground might strengthen Robert's hand in trying to hold the, uh, the, the center conservative wing of the court and maybe step back to a somewhat more incremental approach in the way that they, they address um, the cases that they're going to be hearing this term. But 
we have to imagine that they will also be watching what happens in the midterm elections. And they will take that as some kind of suggestion about how far they can go without facing any serious institutional threat that might be coming from the other branches of government. If, uh, if the, the Democrats do not take the Senate, if the Republicans take the House, that is going to probably empower that hard right wing of the court. And you may see more of the decisions going in that direction. But regardless, at the end of the 2022 term, I suspect that we will be seeing a somewhat different configuration of state versus federal power and a somewhat different configuration of the rights that the court is interested in supporting and advancing versus the rights that the court is interested in, um, in cutting back on. So it will certainly be worth uh, bookmarking uh, strict scrutiny is a podcast to listen to, paying attention to SCOTUS blog, and generally trying to be an informed consumer of the news about the court as we go forward. So we will now be very happy to take your questions. And I see we have one question in the chat. I'm going to just go ahead and bring up Professor Bird and Professor Ingram. Um, this question is from alumnus Michael Tobman. Michael, thank you for joining us today. Uh, and it has a two part question. The first part is the consideration of SCOTUS as a political actor seems more intense these days, but is it more muscular interpretation and use of 14th and 15th amendments decades ago, commerce clause activism years ago, FDR economy recovery, is it more now or does every generation think that it's more for them? And then the second part is the Supreme Court as a focus of political campaigns. Is that new? It, are we being cynical? Is there a cynical component to this? Well, I'd like to take a stab at maybe the first part of Michael's question. So, so is the consideration of SCOTUS as a political actor more intense these days? Um, maybe the three of us aren't the best to answer that question empirically because we have spent a lot of our time trying to convince people that the court is a political actor and that they should pay attention to it because that's a big part of our role and it's a big part of how we teach our courses, right? So I'm not sure it's new in the academic community. I think it probably is new in the way that the Supreme Court is considered by the public. So when I run my pre-core surveys, in a Supreme Court class when I say, do you have, what information do you have about the Supreme Court? Do you think they're doing a good job? The numbers look very different in the last two years than they did when I first did those polls in 2016, 2017. So if my students are starting to pay a lot of attention to the Supreme Court, that's typically an indicator to me that their parents are paying attention, people in their peer groups are paying attention, and it's, it's part of the public conversation. Um, another thing that I'd like to know, especially when we recommend a podcast like Strict Scrutiny, most of the podcasts about the Supreme Court are run by JDs, not JD PhDs, like the three of us. And you have to take into account the level of socialization that is done in law schools about um, the Supreme Court being a good institution, it's trying its best, it's asking hard questions, it's answering hard questions. There may not be a great answer when they ask the hard questions, right? And so when you listen to a lot of lawyers talk about this problem, I think they're more optimistic about the way that the Supreme Court is being viewed as a political institution because they were socialized to think that it is not one. Um, in legal academy spaces, that's probably what you're going to see. In political science academy, places we're saying look at this Martin Quinn score graph that that Professor Ingram showed us earlier so so maybe it's new I think it's new in the public sphere but maybe not in our academic sphere I guess what I would say as somebody um, who's an institutionalist is that I, I still believe that while the court is definitely a political institution it has, at least up until now, had a slightly different set of institutional norms that have constrained the behavior of justices. My question about the current court is the extent to which some of those norms might be breaking down um, and whether something like some of the, what I see as more cynical uses 
of originalism are functioning as the sledgehammer. It's uh, breaking down some of those norms. But in terms of uh, uh, historical consideration of the court, um, sure, you can almost always find somebody who is claiming that the court is behaving politically and making that claim as a criticism of the court, going back pretty far in American history. Um, but the, the kind of noise level on those claims does tend to vary in time. And up until fairly recently, we've been in a period when the court has been a more trusted institution than either the executive branch or Congress. And that seems to be um, undermined somewhat by, by the current political climate and the institutional behavior of the court within that climate. Um, SCOTUS is a focus of political campaigns. Again, it comes and goes. Uh, certainly people were talking about the court, talking about the justices in the 1930s. We saw some of that coming up again in uh, the late Warren Court era. People had bumper stickers, said impeach Earl Warren, and people were trying to make that part of their political campaigns. Up until recently, you could look at public opinion polls uh, where, where um, uh, exit pollers would ask voters what the most important issues were that drove their decisions in presidential elections. And the court would always be pretty far down on that list. In 2016, however, among Republican voters, the court was one of the top three issues. And that really perked up my attention. And I suspect that it's going to be more salient uh, for some time to come in, in current configuration for you. Yeah, I don't I don't have anything to add here. I didn't second what Professor Bird and what Professor Novkov said. I mean if anything I would emphasize that uh, <laughs> that um, at least among political scientists the court has seen as a very as a as a sort of patently political actor for decades. Um, and I, I don't want to speak for others, but you know, having gone through the law school and PhD trajectories, they're very the 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 way the court is discussed in law school is very different than the way the court is discussed in a, say a social science uh, graduate environment. But I, again, I second what has already been said. So should we talk about independent state legislatures? Yeah. Yeah, this is a this is a fascinating case. Um, uh, I, I think Michael Malvin's uh, comment explains it well. Um, the court has taken up cert in a case where there's a conflict over whether the state Supreme Court can have the final word uh, over redistricting which has important implications for this case itself, which comes out of North Carolina, but also more broadly, uh, who gets to have the final say over how elections are run and can a state legislature in effect put itself over uh, a state uh, Supreme Court based on these arguments coming out of the constitution. Um, I, it's a concerning case to me uh, in, in the North Carolina situation, uh, the North Carolina Supreme Court was looking at uh, a question of uh, racial gerrymandering and, and uh, raising problems with this, what the state legislature had done. And uh, the theory is that the Constitution vests this power in the state legislatures. And while we will all say that, yes, courts are political, legislatures are political. Um, there's something worthwhile, at least from where I sit, to allowing judicial oversight of the overtly kind of political and partisan decisions that state legislatures might make. And the most radical implication of this case were the Supreme Court to uphold the idea that the legislature has the last word is that a state legislature could then do whatever it wants. It could, for instance, say, we don't like the way that this election works, so we're going to award our presidential electors to the candidate of our choice, even if the voters went in the other direction. 
but I will let my fellow courts experts weigh in on this one. Oh, just one other thing I wanted to mention about this. It's worth noting that some of the background of this case traces all the way back to Bush versus Gore. Um, and some of the justices currently on the court were involved in George W. Bush's effort to convince the then US Supreme Court that uh, the legislative rules should take precedence over the Florida Supreme Court's um, uh, request that um, a recount be conducted. So Kavanaugh, uh, Chief Justice Roberts, and Justice, uh, Justice Barrett were all involved in that that is practicing lawyers. So I think the thing that is really important about this case is this is exactly the type of case where the public opinion drop after Dobbs is going to have some type of impact. And the way that Professor Novkoff talked about the extreme conservatives versus the, the more centrist conservatives holding coalitions together, that's going to be really important here. And I think we're going, I'm, I'm unsure how to predict the outcome of this case. It doesn't match on a lot of the things that we usually use to predict outcomes of cases. Um, something that's concerning to me here is the centrist involvement in, in Bush v. Gore. So they have a history of making arguments that it would make the outcome of this case go um, in favor of the North Carolina state legislature. And the only thing I could see constraining them in this moment is their terrible public opinion and the fact that John Roberts is extremely concerned about his reputation, his legacy. You can see he's on a speaking tour, an apologist speaking tour of, we still have legitimacy, we're still friends. And then you have Alito being like, no, we're not. Like, <laughs> stop, no, we're not. So it's, it's a huge concern. And so I think the only thing that John Roberts can do in this case is exercising his power as the chief to hold on to this opinion. And what I mean by that is there's this mechanism where we decide who is going to write an opinion based on the chief justice, what side he votes on, and on seniority. So if the chief justice retains the majority vote, he can keep this opinion for himself and make it a narrow, more incremental opinion, which is what his concurrence in Dobbs was a more incrementalist opinion. If he lets go of this vote, it's gonna to go to Thomas or Alito and it's gonna look very, very similar to what the opinion in Dobbs looked like. So we're relying on his ability to hold on and I'm not confident in his ability to hold on, but th that is my concern right now is what's gonna happen in the conference room. Yeah, I'll, I'll just add two observations here. <clears throat> One from a from a legal constitutional perspective, it's it's very difficult, not to say bizarre, to think of sort of interpreting the power of a state of a legislature as wholly outside of the rest of the governance structure or constitutional structure of a state. You know, as as if a as if a legislature uh, were all powerful. Um, you know, and throw all ideas about checks and balances and separation of powers out the window, and it's just entirely up to one actor. But that just generates a lot of intellectual friction, I think, for a lot of legal observers um, from the legal academy and social sciences. Um, from a more, <clears throat> I don't know, empirical, world, worldly, current events perspective, it's it's just. Uh, the it's it's hard to separate or think about this case apart from the events of the last election and everything that led to the insurrection and all of the activities and shenanigans to put it uh, very mildly in the state legislatures and if if this case were to go the way that the um petitioners, I believe in this case, the, the advocates for the independent state legislature theory, um, then there are 
little few or no breaks on on some of the activities that were taking place in the states right to 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 generate alternate electors to to um play with the vote counting um etc so uh, as someone who's invested in and, and interested in protecting democracy and deepening the quality of democracy rather than eroding it um this this kind of case is is really uh disturbing or raising this prospect is is not just an intellectual exercise um, or interesting for legal constitutional reasons it's it's it has very preoccupying implications based on recent events in our country another thing i'd like to add which is related to this is that the in the conference room amongst the justices we have a lot of qualitative evidence of they're they're weighing these cases against each other. So we've highlighted a lot of really important, highly consequential cases today. And something to note is they may, the court likes to bait and switch where they say, we're taking away one person, one vote, and we're going to let the state legislature do whatever they want, but you can keep affirmative action. So you can't be too mad at us. We'll uphold Gruder, but we're gonna take away this other thing. So it, that's possible. How many bad decisions, bad re being relative to where, where you sit on the um, ideological spectrum, how many can we get away with when we have 36% approval in a public opinion poll? How many of those can we get away with when there's a Democratic president and a democratically held um, legislature. That's part of their calculation. So I, this is another place to highlight that the midterms really are going to matter, um, especially in swing states where North Carolina is not always a swing state, but it could be, it has the potential to be. Lots of people have moved to North Carolina in the last couple of years. It's very similar to Georgia in terms of relocations from the Northeast. So it's something to, to keep a close eye on. And I don't see any other questions yet, but I encourage our audience to feel free to jump in and ask any questions you might have. Well, if no one else has a question, I want to ask my colleagues, um, what case that's on the docket this term do you think you're going to be thinking about 10 years down the road? This is such a hard question because there's just too many to choose from right now. Um, there's one that I, I meant to bring up earlier and I'm very concerned with the way it's going and with the rhetoric and the briefs, but there is a challenge to ICWA right now, which is the Indian Child Welfare Act. And this is another opportunity for the Supreme Court to overturn affirmative action in spirit, if not outright. So they could decimate Gruder and say, but we gave you ICWA instead. So we're going to let Native children be with Native families. Or they could do the opposite, where we overturn Gruder. We can't consider um, race in college admissions, but we can do it when it comes to placing children in homes that are culturally relevant to the cultures that they're from. So I, I am concerned that they are going to split on these cases. And ICWA um, was first passed in 1978. It's an old statute. And it recently had success at the Supreme Court where they allowed a child to stay with its biological father after being placed in an adoptive parent couple for I think the child was three before she got back to Oklahoma, which is where I'm originally from. And so I, I pay a lot of attention to cases like this because it undermines sovereignty. The argument is coming under the 10th Amendment. And this is also the first time ICWA has been challenged where the head of the um, agency is a native woman. Um, it's gonna be, it's gonna be a very important case that people will not pay attention to. Um, and I, it has very severe implications for how we handle Native American and indigenous relations in the US. It might be worth noting on that case that if it does go in the direction that you suspect it might, uh, we could see a very impassioned dissent from Justice Gorsuch. 
who by many accounts is the best friend Native Americans have ever had. Yes. What about you, Matt? You got one in mind? Sleeper case or one of the ones everybody would expect to be uh, a blockbuster? Uh, no, I don't. I don't have another case um, aside from the ones that we've talked about. You know, I'm in terms of the ones that we'll be thinking about ten years from now. It's it's hard to. to I mean, yes, all the cases that we've talked about, right? Affirmative action, wrongful convictions, or you know, criminal procedure. Um, those are all important and valuable. Um, but I, I guess the ones that we might be talking about 10 years from now or 20 years from now, it might be some of the tech cases that, that Professor Bird brought up earlier or the environmental cases, you know, I mean, we're, I'm also drawn to the cases that have to do with the health of our democracy, but on the heels of the West Virginia case last term that you mentioned in passing, then you know, revisiting the Clean Air Act and the Clean Water Act in quick succession um, are, are both um, preoccupying given the larger environmental consequences. So maybe those are the ones we might be thinking about oh, 10 years from now. Yeah, I was also thinking about this case in relation to the ongoing discussion of incremental restrictions on abortion. So there is one that that it, that just had oral argument. It's the the pork case, um, the bacon regulation case. Yeah, so it's a dormant commerce clause case, and um, I'll let Professor Noko talk about this because she's very into it. But it it has it. Justice Thomas doesn't think that the dormant commerce clause exists, and this is about the the ability to regulate um, commerce between states, which is really important if you're trying to ship a Plan B pill to Texas. So, yeah, I, I was going to call this one out, you know, because I'm all about regulating Megan. Um, <laughs> but it, it raises some really important questions about federalism uh, that have been simmering for a while, but could be headed toward more of a full boil. Um, if you have a state like California that wants to pass maybe stricter regulations on any kind of issue, whatever it might be, in this case, it is. Um, it, it is a regulation of uh, pork production and housing of, of farm animals that are uh, being used to produce meat. Um, can uh, can uh, the producers come in and say, hey, wait a minute, you can't have that kind of regulation in one state if it's going to have an impact on the way that we do our business in a different state. So it could undercut the strategy that I think a lot of, um, of more left-leaning folks have figured would carry through if we do see the court doubling down and tripling down on lifting all kinds of federal oversight over issues um, that, that liberals find to be important. Um, right, the answer is, all right, if you're in a blue state, don't worry. You're going to still have uh, your own laws about abortion. You can put your own environmental regulations into effect. Uh, you can uh, regulate uh, against the kinds of discrimination that you don't like. It's all good. This case suggests that maybe it's not all good, especially if you're talking about a regulation that might have an impact on something outside of your, your little blue uh, paradise. Or, you know, to flip the script outside of your little red paradise down the road. It also might be worth noting, and we probably should have highlighted this at the beginning, but since the pandemic, the Supreme Court hosts live oral arguments now, and they're really fun to listen to live. Maybe that's biased, and I just think they're really fun to listen to live, but you can find those usually um, and, and sometimes they're transcribed live, which is really useful. Um, NPR hosts those. And I think C-SPAN hosts them as well. So you can listen to them live. And I think this is incredibly important, especially for cases like um, the North Carolina elections case, because having live access to these cases means that the public opinion turnaround can be faster. People can hear what goes on in these cases without having to wait a full week for the oral argument audio to be posted on the Supreme Court website. And it makes journalism much faster. Um, and Michael has, he says, um, 
independent legislatures are responsible for electing and otherwise defeated Donald Trump, people could be talking about that for centuries. I, I don't disagree. Yeah, you're not going to get us to fight you on that. No, no. <laughs> but right. it's a huge, it's yes. A, mm -hmm. It's a big one. Um, but yes, you can listen live. Uh, we're going to listen live on Halloween for they uh, put the affirmative action cases on Halloween to make it extra spooky and extra scary. Um, so we will be listening to those live. Any continued procedural fallout from the decision? That's an interesting question. Um, I have not seen anything in the media about any results from the investigation uh, to see who it was who leaked that Dobbs draft. Um, and all I've seen is continued speculation about uh, who would have benefited from that leak. Total silence. And the, I think there will continue to be total silence. I think we will never know. And the closest we can get is seeing where the clerks went, what law firm they went to. And if a clerk doesn't place, that could be an indicator, but I don't think we'll ever have that report. Um, maybe someday in John Roberts' papers, he'll release it. Maybe he'll have some feelings, but that's that's another thing that I, I think we just are not gonna see until papers come out in 20 to 30 years. I don't know how much time we have left, but on the topic of oral argument, um, I was wondering if either of you have any observations or comments about uh, Justice Thomas's continued insistence on asking the first question every argument, and then the second, a second unrelated, separate question. Um, new Justice Jackson has been extremely active and effective in oral arguments. So I was wondering if you have any observations on either of those. Something that I think we're seeing, and this is something the three of us and Professor Stoller have talked about quite a bit, is that there, there does seem to be um, a dip in the, the appearance of collegiality on the Supreme Court. You can hear them quipping at each other in oral argument, which may at one point have been interpreted as good natured, right? So in the Andy Warhol case that was just argued, Clarence Thomas is like, oh, well, I used to be a fan of Prince. And Elena Kagan says, oh, are you not anymore? Um, which, you know, she she cuts into his argument. Um, I, I think we're seeing that in oral argument. We're also seeing uh, Sonia Sotomayor taking up the hypothetical asker um, after Justice Breyer's um, departure. So he used to, his brand was like weird hypotheticals that he would ask an oral argument. And I think um, Justice Sotomayor has taken up that role. 